Winter Park Ski Train began its trip west over the Continental Divide from Denver on Colorado's Front Range. Passengers boarded the ski train at Denver Union Station. The two-hour trip by rail to the Winter Park Ski Resort began at 7.15 in the morning. The Winter Park Ski Resort was constructed at the west portal of the Moffat Tunnel. This was once the site of the Fleming Brothers Sawmill. Ski runs were constructed during the summer of 1939. The city of Denver owned the Winter Park Ski Resort. It was dedicated on January 28, 1940. About 10,000 skiers enjoyed the new ski area that year. The resort made $10,000 in gross revenue during its first winter ski season. The first Rio Grande ski train to Winter Park left Denver Union Station westbound in late December 1947. The Eskimo Ski Club owner, Frank Bulkley, asked the Rio Grande to run a regular weekend passenger train to Winter Park. He asked the railroad to run a train on a more convenient schedule to maximize time for skiing. The Rio Grande also accommodated Buckley's request to unload passengers at the ski area rather than at the nearby Winter Park Station. The majority of skiers who rode the weekend ski train during the early years were children who belonged to the Eskimo Ski Club. At the end of the day, the ski train departed Winter Park promptly at 4.15 for a 6.15 arrival back at Denver Union Station. In November of 1984, the Rio Grande Railroad came under the control of its largest stockholder, Denver billionaire Philip Anschutz. The railroad was then owned by the Anschutz Corporation. A subsidiary, the Ansco Investment Company, gained ownership and operational control of the Winter Park ski train in 1985. This transaction effectively separated the ski train from the railroad. The Rio Grande assigned locomotives and crews to the ski train and dispatched it to Winter Park. But marketing, ticketing, and other operations were the responsibility of the Ansco company. Philip Anschutz devised a business plan to significantly upgrade Rio Grande ski train service.
The plan included the purchase of used commuter passenger cars for the ski train. Ski train improvements by Philip Anschutz included a computerized ticket system, improved customer service, and 17 used Hawker Sidley Tempo cars purchased from Canada. The new ski train came equipped with two cafe lounge cars, nine coaches, and three first class parlor cars. Passengers could purchase breakfast in the cafe cars westbound and snacks eastbound. Breakfast and refreshments were included for first-class passengers in the parlor cars. Total capacity was 750 passengers. Finally, three of the railroad's own private cars were added to the end of the ski train for luxury service. The Tempo cars were originally introduced into passenger rail service between Montreal, Quebec, and Toronto, Ontario on June 17, 1968. They were built for the Canadian National Railway to operate at speeds up to 120 miles per hour. Philip Anschutz purchased the cars from Via Rail, Canada's equivalent of Amtrak. Only 14 of the 17 cars purchased were placed into ski train service. The other three cars were stored for parts. The train was remodeled to accommodate skiers. It then was put on display at Denver Union Station on December 10, 1987. Ski train packages were already being offered by two downtown Denver hotels. The Oxford and the Hyatt Regency Denver helped to fill the seats for the January 2nd, 1988 inaugural run. The same year the new Winter Park ski train began operating, the Denver and Rio Grande Western ceased to exist as a railroad. The financially stable Rio Grande acquired the larger, but financially troubled, Southern Pacific Railroad in 1988. For marketing purposes, the more familiar Southern Pacific name remained. The ski train was one of the last remnants of the historic Denver and Rio Grande Western to continue to operate. At the end of the Rio Grande era, the railroad relied primarily on its diesel locomotive fleet of 17 six-axle SD50s and 71 six-axle SD40 T-2s to get its trains over the Rocky Mountains. The SD40 T-2 model, built by General Motors Electromotive Division, was especially unique. It was designed specifically for mountain railroading. These diesel locomotives were called tunnel motors.
equipped with an electric wheel adhesion system called positive traction control. The SD40 T-2 tunnel motor was designed to handle slow climbing speeds without shutting down or overheating in long tunnels. The first customized tunnel motor diesel locomotives with direct current electric traction motors were actually delivered to the Southern Pacific Railroad in 1972. The Southern Pacific and the Rio Grande were the only railroads to own new tunnel motor diesels. Passengers paid $125 per person to ride the Winter Park ski train to Cheyenne. Their tickets also included a private catered barbecue and special reserved seats at one of the nation's largest rodeos. Other activities included a parade through downtown. The annual Frontier Days celebration was how the community of Cheyenne remembered its history as a rugged western railroad town. Assigned to pull the ski train was Union Pacific Centennial Class Diesel number 6936. The Centennials were the largest diesel locomotives ever built. The Centennials were delivered to no railroad other than the Union Pacific. They were built in 1969, 100 years after the driving of the Golden Spike in 1869. The Cheyenne Frontier Days Special was sponsored by the Ski Train's regular corporate sponsor, the Denver Post newspaper. Ticket sale proceeds were donated to charities. Special trains to Cheyenne Frontier Days began operating in 1908. Service was suspended during World War II. Also, there were no special Frontier Days trains from 1970 until 1992. In 1992, the Denver Post newspaper celebrated its centennial by reviving the special train to Cheyenne. Chartered for the trip was the Winter Park Ski Train.
Typically, very few seats were available on the Amtrak train for short-haul passengers to the Fraser Valley near Winter Park. The Zephyr was operated as a long-distance inner-city passenger train and was not intended to be a ski train. Amtrak's trains for destination skiers included the Vermonter and Ethan Allen Express from New York to Vermont. Southern Pacific Railroad allowed the Burlington Northern to run their executive train over the Moffat Tunnel route. The Burlington Northern executive ski train carried BN employees who worked in Fort Worth, Texas and Minneapolis, Minnesota. The train ran from Denver to the ski resort. The BN employees stayed in Winter Park until January 18th. Part of the train and a number of employees continued west by rail following this Winter Park vacation. A shorter executive ski train returned to Denver. The westbound California Zephyr passed through tunnel number one, the first of many on the Moffat Tunnel route. Waiting on the other side was the Burlington Northern Executive Ski Train. There were originally 31 tunnels between Denver and Winter Park, including the Moffat Tunnel. Two were daylighted, number nine and number 28. On the rear of the Zephyr was Southern Pacific business car, Sunset.
as of the 1993-1994 winter ski season, the Southern Pacific Railroad no longer assigned former Rio Grande diesels to the ski train. The lead locomotive assigned to that season's ski train belonged to one of Southern Pacific's subsidiary railroads, the St. Louis Southwestern. The Southern Pacific gained control of the St. Louis Southwestern in 1932. The St. Louis Southwestern was marketed as the Cotton Belt route. After passengers detrained at the Winter Park ski area, the ski train headed west to turn around on the Tabernash Y. Once turned, the ski train moved east to the siding in Fraser, where it would spend the day. The Moffat Tunnel route was named after David Halliday Moffat, Jr. He was a banker turned railroad man. Early in 1902, he announced his intention to build a standard gauge, first-class railroad through the Rocky Mountains. Longer and heavier freight trains, especially coal trains, required extra locomotives to cross the Continental Divide. In 1913, the bankrupt Denver, Northwestern, and Pacific Railway was reorganized. It was renamed the Denver and Salt Lake Railroad. Rails were extended west to the coal fields in Craig, Colorado, before construction stopped in 1914. Far short of David Moffat's goal to reach Salt Lake City, Utah, the railroad terminated 255 miles west of Denver. The climb over the 11,660-foot Rollins Pass was extremely difficult for the Denver and Salt Lake Railroad. An alternative to the steep grades and frequently snowy weather at the top of the Continental Divide had to be found. On April 29, 1922, the Colorado State Legislature passed the Moffat Tunnel Bill it allocated public money toward the construction of a railroad tunnel and a water tunnel. Excavation of the two tunnels began in July 1923. The water tunnel was built to pipe western slope water to Denver. The six-mile railroad tunnel beneath the Continental Divide was bored through on July 7, 1927. Once construction was completed and the track laid, the first train crested the 9,239-foot apex of the Moffat Tunnel. An eastbound 12-car freight train was the first train to pass through the tunnel. It went through on February 24, 1928.
Rio Grande officially absorbed the Moffat Tunnel Route and the Denver and Salt Lake Railroad on April 11, 1947. During the 1993-1994 winter ski season, Winter Park was the fifth most popular ski resort in the United States. The resort had over 7,600 acres for skiing. The city of Denver originally invested $275,000 into the ski resort when it opened in 1940. By 1994, Winter Park was valued at just under $100 million. The city of Denver was entitled to 3% of gross revenues, plus an additional $1 million annually from the ski resort. The first year that the Denver Post Cheyenne Frontier Days Special was powered by a steam locomotive was 1994. The third annual run of the ski train to Cheyenne, Wyoming took place on July 23rd. Tickets cost from $150 to $225 per person. A catered barbecue and reserved seats at the Daddy of them all, Rodeo, were included in the ticket price. The 1994 trip sold out within nine days. Union Pacific Steam Locomotive, Challenger Class Malay number 3985, was built by the American Locomotive Company in July 1943. It was one of 105 articulated 4664 steam locomotives owned by the Union Pacific. The locomotive was retired but stored serviceable in 1959. The Challenger was later placed in a park, west of the Cheyenne Passenger Station, in 1975. By 1980, the Challenger was back in the roundhouse, being restored to operating condition. Restoration was complete on March 18, 1981. On that day, the Challenger moved once again under its own power.
The ski train traversed the route of Union Pacific's once famous City of Portland streamliner passenger train. Since 1992, proceeds from passenger train ticket sales provided more than $200,000 for Denver Post charities. The return trip of the ski train was powered by two steam locomotives, Union Pacific Northern Class number 844 and Challenger Class number 3985. Number 844 was built by the American Locomotive Company. It was delivered to the Union Pacific in October 1944. The 1996-1997 winter ski season was like a time war for the Winter Park ski train. Assigned motive power to the ski train was two former Denver and Rio Grande Western GP60s, number 3155 and number 3156. They were the last diesel locomotives delivered to the Rio Grande by General Motors Electromotive Division. By this time, the Southern Pacific no longer owned the former Rio Grande Moffat Tunnel route. On July 3, 1996, the U.S. Surface Transportation Board approved the merger of the Southern Pacific Railroad with the Union Pacific Railroad. The Southern Pacific was officially absorbed into the massive Union Pacific Rail Network on September 11, 1996. Its $5.4 billion acquisition of the Southern Pacific made Union Pacific's rail network the largest in North America. The Union Pacific operated approximately 2,000 trains a day over nearly 36,000 miles of railroad in 25 states.
traditionally, the Winter Park Ski Train operated during the winter ski season on Saturdays and Sundays only. The popularity of the ski train was such that Friday trips were added in March 1997. During the 1996-1997 ski season, the Winter Park Ski Train was operating at 93% capacity. The key to the ski train's success was marketing. It was estimated that non-skiers made up 40% of the Winter Park Ski Train's average ridership. Three private passenger cars on the end of the Winter Park ski train were available for charter from the Anschutz Corporation. The three cars were the California, a dome car, the Utah, a cafe lounge car, and the Kansas, an open platform observation car. It was built by Pullman as business car Wilson McCarthy for the Denver and Rio Grande Western Railroad in 1950. McCarthy was a former president of the Denver and Salt Lake Railroad. The lounge area had large picture windows for viewing Colorado mountain scenery. The Union Pacific began repainting the old Rio Grande GP60's armor yellow, beginning with number 3156 in 1998. Rio Grande 3156 was renumbered Union Pacific 5702. The Moffat Tunnel Route has the greatest concentration of tunnels of any rail route in the Western Hemisphere. 25 of 29 tunnels are located within 27 miles of track. Sharp curves and steep grades made operating trains over the Moffat Tunnel Route a challenge. Although the Winter Park Ski Train operated on a regular schedule, it was dispatched by the Union Pacific as a passenger extra. As the Winter Park Ski Train passed Crescent Siding, passengers were able to enjoy the views of Roosevelt National Forest including South Boulder Creek Canyon and Gross Reservoir. Approximately 14 billion gallons of water for the Denver area passed through Gross Reservoir Dam annually. March 23, 1997, Winter Park Ski Train returned to Denver eastbound from Winter Park. Behind it was the eastbound California Zephyr. Grand, to the Southern Pacific, to the Union Pacific, from the days of the Eskimo Ski Club, beginning in 1947, the ski train hauled skiers and visitors to the Winter Park Ski Resort, 
just on the west side of the Continental Divide.